elaborate, Nan Wang Chi said. This entirely courteous remark, uttered by the man sitting nearby, had such power it was practically a threat. Nia Hui Sang dragged his feet, but he began to give an explanation. Hong Wang, the two of you know that we, the Nia clan, are different from the other cultivation clans. Because our founder was a butcher, we take the path of the saber instead of cultivating with the sword. Thus, everyone knew. It was not the least bit secret. Even the emblem of the Ching Nia clan had a ferocious appearance. The head of a beast which resembled both a hound and a boar. Because we cultivate differently from other clans, Nia Hui Sang continued, and because of our founding ancestor's background as a butcher, we can't avoid being coated in the sheen of blood. The sabers of our past clan chiefs are suffused with intensely malevolent, bloodthirsty energy. Nearly every chief died a violent death by qi deviation. Their angry temperaments are also very relevant to the matter at hand. Nia Hui Sang's older brother, Nia Ming Jue, was a good example. The young clan leader had been sworn brothers with Lan Si Chen and Jin Guangyao. Chi Feng Zun was as decisive as thunder and as swift as the wind, imposing and awe-inspiring. Zhe Wu Jun was as gentle as soft jade, noble and righteous. The Fang Zun was as polished as a freshly cut gem, sharp and cunning. The three had made their oath of brotherhood during the Sunshot campaign, and stories of each man's glorious deeds were known far and wide. The younger generations referred to them as the Three Zun. However, just as Nia Ming Jue's reputation was at its peak, he experienced a chi deviation at a conference of renowned cultivators and died a sudden and bloody death. Moreover, in his crazed frenzy that day, he pursued and injured many conference participants with the swing of his saber. His whole lifetime of glory thus reached such a conclusion. Nia Hui Sang could only have been thinking of his older brother, his face fell, and he spoke again. While our clan chiefs live, they keep a lid on the restless energy of their sabers. But after they pass away, no one can control the weapons anymore, so they turn murderous. Rei Wishin furrowed his brow. That seems pretty close to demonic cultivation, he commented. They're not the same, Niu Hui Sang said hastily. Demonic cultivation is demonic cultivation because it demands human lives. But our sabers don't want people. They want vengeful, malicious spirits, monsters, demons, and so on. They spend a lifetime hacking those things to pieces. So if we don't offer them some to exterminate, they start to stir up trouble and disrupt our peace. Saber spirits recognize only a single master. No one else can wield them. But we later generations, it's not like we can just melt them down. First, it's disrespectful to our ancestors. And second, melting the sabers down might not even solve the problem. Demanding, aren't they? We wish and said. Of course they are. These sabers fought and cultivated beside our entire line of ancestors, cutting down obstacles together. They're basically our ancestors too. Niu Hui Sang continued. As every generation of clan chief's cultivation level increased, the problem also got worse, until our sixth clan chief thought of a method to deal with it. Building the man-eating fortress? Mei asked. No, no, Niu Hui Sang said. It's related, but in the beginning, we hadn't thought of it yet. Our clan chief's method was to build a pair of coffins for his father and grandfather's sabers and dig a tomb for them. 
He didn't put any valuable treasures inside the tomb, though. Instead, he buried the sabers with a few hundred bodies that were on the verge of transforming into fierce corpses. A very slight wrinkle appeared between Lan Wang Ji's brows. Frightened, Neil Hui Sang immediately added, Hong Kong Jun, I can explain. Those corpses weren't killed by our own people. They were gathered from far and wide, through sweat and toil. We spent a bunch of gold buying a lot of them too. Our sixth clan chief said that since these saber spirits wanted to do battle with evil spirits, we would give them evil spirits and let them fight for eternity. So he buried corpses that were on the verge of transforming into ghosts together with the coffins containing the sabers. The bodies were basically funerary objects. The saber spirits suppressed the corpses' transformation and at the same time, the corpses alleviated the saber's lust for violence and the burden they placed on our clan. The sabers and spirits checked each other, and this kept the situation from deteriorating. Only through relying on this method were the next few generations able to enjoy peace. Then why was the stone fortress built later on? Mewishin asked. Why bury the corpses inside the walls? And you said the fortress has also eaten people? These questions are all actually the same question, Ye Hui Sang replied. I suppose it has eaten people before, but it wasn't on purpose. The tomb our sixth clan chief built was only a normal tomb, and the next few generations followed soon. But a little over 50 years ago, some grave robbers dug it up. Ye Hui Sang let out an O. Oh. That's really tempting fate, he thought to himself. No matter how quiet and careful you are, information about a project as big as tomb building is bound to leak out and start rumours, Nyo Hui Sang continued. So that group of grave robbers asked around and determined that there was a grand, earlier era tomb atop Xinglu Ridge. They planned to dig it up for a long time, so when they came, they were prepared. Amongst this group of crooks, there were one or two people who were different from the others who possessed real skills. They figured out the tomb's exact location, broke the maze illusion surrounding it, and found my clan's sabre tomb. The robbers then dug a hole and entered it. They were professional. By that point, they had all seen many dead bodies before, so they weren't afraid of the corpses inside. But as the grave robbers were turning the place upside down in search of gold and jewels, they were breathing near the bodies, and what's more, all of them were young, robust men, full of yang energy. Keep in mind that all of the corpses lying inside the tomb were on the verge of transforming. It's easy to imagine what happened next. A dozen or so corpses rose and transformed into fierce ghosts right then and there. However, these grave robbers were skilled and daring. Even though they were disorganized, they were fully equipped, and with everyone fighting side by side, they managed to send the transformed corpses back to the grave again, leaving the ground littered with dismembered bodies afterward. Having become aware of the tomb's danger, the robbers prepared to escape, but just as they were leaving, they were eaten. The tomb's corpse population was strictly controlled. Not one more, not one less. Just enough for the bodies and the saber spirits to check each other. If the ruckus the grave robbers raised had only triggered the corpse's transformation, that would have been one thing. Once they were gone, the saber spirits would have risen and suppressed the transformation again. But instead, they hacked the corpses to pieces and suddenly the tomb was short a dozen bodies. In order to have enough fierce corpses to preserve the balance of power, the tomb, it, it could only automatically seal itself and trap the living robbers inside, forcing them to make up for the shortage that they had created. 
Since the saber too was wrecked, the clan chief at the time began thinking of a different solution. He found a new location on Xingli Ridge and built a saber temple in the tomb's den. In order to prevent grey robbers from gracing the corpses with their presence again, he concealed them inside the walls, shielding them from prying eyes. The Saber Temple is precisely the rumoured man-eating fortress. When the group of grave robbers came to Qinghe, they were disguised as hunters. Since they had entered Qinglu Ridge without ever returning, yet their bodies were nowhere to be found, rumours that they had been eaten by some sort of monster living on the ridge began to circulate. Later, once the fortress was complete, but before a new maze illusion had been set up, someone accidentally stumbled upon the fortress. Luckily, no doors had been built on any of the fortress's buildings, so he couldn't get in. But after he descended from the ridge, he told the people he met that there was a strange white fortress atop Xing Lu Ridge, and that the man-eating monster had to be living inside. Our clan thought that if the rumours got a little louder and wilder, that would be good too, since no one would dare approach the fortress then. So we added some extra colour and flavour to the stories and started rumours about a man-eating fortress, but it actually can eat people. Nia Hui Sang pulled a handkerchief and a white stone about the size of a head of garlic out of his sleeve. He wiped off some sweat with the handkerchief and passed the stone over. Please take a look at this, he said. Mary Shen accepted the rock and examined it in detail. He discovered that something white was poking out from the powdery talcum. It looked like the bone from a human finger. The snow white light of comprehension flashed in his mind. Niu Hui Sang calmed down after he finished drying his sweat. That young master, Jin, ah, oh, I don't know what method he used to blast a hole in the wall. If he was able to blow through such a thick wall, he must have been carrying many valuable cultivation tools on his person. No, that's not the main point. I was saying, the part of the wall he blasted apart just happened to be the earliest saber temple our clan had built. At the time, we hadn't thought of creating two layers of stone brick and filling the middle with earth to prevent the corpses from absorbing yang energy and transforming so easily. Instead, the corpses were buried directly into mortar. So when young Master Jin blasted a hole in the wall, he didn't notice that he had also blasted a skeleton apart that was buried inside. Not long after he entered, he was sucked into the fortress's walls in order to replace the remains he had destroyed. I visit Qingli Ridge on a regular basis to inspect the temple. On today's trip, I found this piece of rock. Right as I picked it up, a dog came and bit me. Ugh, the Sabre Temple it's pretty much our clan's ancestral tomb. I really... The more Nia Huisang spoke, the worse he felt. Ordinary cultivators know the boundaries of our territory and would never come to the Qinghe area to night hunt. Who could have known? Who could have known that he'd be so unfortunate? First, the unruly and disobedient Jinling had set his sights on Xingli Ridge. Then the Lun and Wei pair had followed the directions of the ghost hand here as well. Niu Hui Sang spoke again. Hang Guangjun, as well as you, sir, I told you everything. Please, don't ever let it get out. Otherwise, otherwise, if such a thing became widely known, Niu Hui Sang would become a villain, condemned by generation after generation. The Ching Hunia clan already had one foot in the grave. After he was dead and buried, he would be too ashamed to look his ancestors in the eye. No wonder he would rather be the quiet laughingstock of the world of cultivation. 
No wonder, he was reluctant to cultivate diligently, and was even more slow and fearful of unsheathing his blade. If he succeeded in developing his level of cultivation, his temperament would begin to grow more and more volatile by the day, and he would eventually wind up like his elder brother and everyone who came before him, dying in a burst of madness. Even after he was dead, his saber would still haunt the world of the living, disturbing the peace of his entire clan. It was better to be a complete failure. The problem was also impossible to solve. It began with the founder of the Nia clan and had been passed on from one generation to the next until the present. Would later generations have to reject the path their forefathers had found and the foundations they had laid? Each cultivation sect had a speciality. Just as the Gusulan clan had their musical skill, the Chinghenia clan had their saber spirits, which were powerful, fierce, and unyielding. This was precisely what distinguished them from the other branches of the tree of cultivation. If they were to relinquish their ancestors' teachings and begin again from scratch, who knew how many years they would have to waste searching for a different pot? Neither was there any guarantee of success. Moreover, Nia Hui Sang would never dare defect from the Nia clan for another path of cultivation. Because of this, he could only play the part of a worthless pustule. If he wasn't a clan chief and could spend his whole life how he spent it at the cloud recesses, swimming in lakes, painting vans, fishing and baiting birds all day, he would have certainly lived far more at ease than he did presently. But his older brother had already passed. No matter how his abilities fell short of what was desirable, he had no other option but to carry his clan's burden and limp forward one step at a time. Many rounds of begging and beseeching later, Niel Hui Sang finally left. Afterwards, where Wuxian slipped into a daze for a period before suddenly realizing that Lan Wangji had come over to him, gone down on one knee again, and was diligently rolling up his pant leg. Hastily, Wei Wuxian said, Wait, wait, again? First, we eliminate this curse mark, Lan Wangji said. Within a single day, Hong Gongjun had adopted this half-kneeling posture in front of him, several times. Though the other man's expression was exceedingly solemn, Wei Wuxian couldn't bear to witness this tableau. I'll do it myself, he said. He rolled up the fabric in two or three motions and saw that not only did the curse mark now cover his entire calf, it had also climbed past his knee and up his thigh. Wei Wuxian examined it, then said thoughtlessly, It's reached. My hip. Lan Wangji turned his head and did not reply. Confused, Wei Wuxian said, Lan Chan, 